Hey humans, it's Hannah. Welcome back to my channel. This week's video, we are talking about Carl McCunn. This was actually picked by my Patreons in their poll last month. So most of us have heard about the story of Into the Wild and how that man in the wilderness of Alaska ends up passing away. This is actually kind of the prequel to that. This has actually happened before and this story is way less talked about. People often refer to Carl McCunn as the unluckiest man in the world. Carl was born on January 25th, 1947 in Munich, Germany. His father was Donovan McCunn and his mother's name was Erica Hess. The reason he was born in Germany was because Donovan, Carl's father, was stationed for the U.S. Army in Munich. However, the family did soon move back to the United States, where Carl would be mostly raised in San Antonio, Texas. In 1964, Carl would successfully graduate high school and he would even enroll in community college. He started going to community college, but he actually ended up dropping out. Instead, he followed his father's footsteps and joined the military. He actually served in the Navy. He served in the Navy for a full four years, and in 1969, he was discharged. He was about 23 at this time. He decided that he wanted to leave Texas and go north. He moved to Seattle, Washington for a short amount of time, but he decided that was not north enough, and he ended up after that, going to Alaska. He moved to Anchorage in 1970. It was after moving to Alaska that he soon discovered his passion for wildlife photography. In fact, in 1976, Carl went to the Brooks Range and lived there by himself for five whole months. The Brooks Range is a 700-mile mountain range that goes across northern Alaska and stretches across Canada's Yukon Territory. The mountain's peak height is 8,976 feet or 2,736 meters tall. That trip all went fine and well. It was in 1981 when Carl set out for another five-month excursion. Unfortunately, once he left for this excursion, little did he know, he would not return home. In March of 1981, Carl had a bush pilot, so he hired somebody to fly him to this very remote location by this lake in Alaska. This lake was so remote, it didn't even have an official name. He was about 225 miles northeast of Fairbanks. He was going to stay there again for five full months, primarily to do wildlife photography. All he had on his back was 500 rolls of film. He carried two rifles, one shotgun, and he had about 1,400 pounds of provisions. If you don't know what provisions are, it's essentially food and supplies. This first series of unfortunate events here started when he made his first pretty bad decision. Carl, soon after getting there, decided that he was carrying too much ammo for five months. He disposed of five whole boxes of his shotgun shells in the river next to his camp. Side note here, I have no idea why he chose to litter, basically. Like, I don't know why he chose to actually throw these boxes into the river rather than just stash them somewhere for maybe somebody else or to take home at the end of the trip. I have no idea, especially as a wildlife photographer, you'd think you'd be concerned about conservation and you know, not littering and stuff. However, it was like 40 years ago, over 40 years ago now. So I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and assume that conservation was not on the top of a lot of people's minds back then or something. But I have no idea why he specifically threw it in the river. I'm sure if there is a good reason, somebody in the comments will tell me. Among his supplies was a diary and they would find his 100 page diary after Carl was eventually found. He would later write in his journal about this specific mistake. I kept thinking of all the shotgun shells I threw away about two months ago, had five boxes, and when I kept seeing them sitting there, I felt rather silly for having brought so many. Felt like a warmonger. So I threw all away, but about a dozen. Real bright. Who would have known I might need them just to keep from starving? So the plan was to be dropped off in March of 1981, which he was, and he was supposed to be picked up by another pilot in August of that year. That that was the plan and as I've already hinted, everything in his plan went 
wrong. Now, this part of the story is kind of confusing. The different sources say different things. So I'm going to tell you what they say. So the Wikipedia page says that it was a friend of Carl's who was also a pilot and they had a miscommunication. Wikipedia basically says he couldn't afford to hire a bush pilot both ways. So he only hired the bush pilot to drop him off and that Carl thought his friend was coming to pick him up, but it turns out his friend did not get that memo. Other articles just say that he was flown in by the bush pilot and that Carl was under the impression that this bush pilot knew that he would need to be picked up in August. But the pilot, on the other hand, was under the impression that Carl was aware of the fact that he could not, in fact, pick him up in August. And he believed that Carl had made other arrangements to be picked up, which is why he dropped him off without much question. So there just clearly was a lack of communication here. To fill in the blanks a little bit, what I believe the sources are trying to say is that the P Bush pilot was like one of Carl's friends too. And I'm guessing he was kind of both. And that's kind of why the articles get confusing. But regardless, the details of it don't really matter. The end result is that he got dropped off in the middle of effing nowhere without any exit plan. Most of the trip went well. Carl spent the first most almost five months just doing what he planned to do, living off of his supplies and doing the wildlife photography. But early August comes around and it's Alaska, of course. Alaska is very cold and the weather is starting to turn. Carl's supplies at this point, of course, are running low. He still has some because he planned for a full five months, but they are running low. The day that the bush pilot was in Carl's mind scheduled to come pick him up, came and went. And it was around this time that Carl wrote another entry in his journal. It read, I think I should have used more foresight about arranging my departure. I'll find out soon. Now, mind you, unless somebody actually went out to search for him, Carl was never going to be found by just a random plane passing by or anything like that. He was that remote. He wasn't in the line of travel for other aircrafts. So it's the beginning of August and Carl is starting to wonder if his friend is like just running late or if perhaps sure enough, he thought that the plan was all arranged, but his friend did not. So that's the beginning of August where Carl kind of realizes that something might be wrong, but has hope still that the pilot is still coming to get him. Maybe they're just running late for whatever reason, or they're just not too worried about Carl staying through the end of August or what have you. Carl at the beginning of August, though had hopes that somebody was still going to come to get him. Mid-August rolls around and it's clear to Carl that his friend or the pilot, whoever he thought was going to pick him up, was definitely not coming. He ended up starting to hunt for food to make his supplies last longer. The weather was getting colder, like I said, but it was still warm-ish. It was still around 60 degrees Fahrenheit. But it was also constantly rainy and windy, which just made Carl's day-to-day -day a little trickier. He hunted ducks and muskrats in the area and was able to eat some of those. He would even try to dry out the meat of reindeer that he would watch get stuck in the lake and end up drowning. So it's around the end of August now, and he's not happy, but he's still doing okay. He still has enough food. He has some supplies. According to Carl's journals around this time, he was holding out hope that his family and friends would realize that he hadn't returned in the allotted time that he said he would, and that somebody would send out a search for him. He wasn't completely unprepared. He did give out three maps with his campsite location marked on the maps to two of his friends and his father. So several people did know where he was. However, his father didn't know when he was supposed to be back at all. He didn't even know that it was supposed to be August. So it wasn't like his father started to worry in August. Not only that, but Carl specifically told his father before he left that he might stay longer than August if things were going well and not to worry if he didn't show up by the end of the summer. When he was on a previous wildlife trip, his father had actually contacted the police when Carl was late to return, but everything was fine and Carl had just ended up staying late. So not only did his father end up 
feeling, you know, silly, Carl asked his father, like, don't do that again. Don't call the police if I don't show up because I'm probably fine and just staying late. So again, just terrible luck with that because his father was not worried and Carl had specifically told him not to worry. At the very end of August, Carl's friends finally did start to get a little concerned and they did send a state trooper to go look over Carl's camp. Sure enough, a state trooper flew right over him and saw Carl waving his brightly colored like orange red sleeping bag over his head at the pilot. Carl also punched his fist in the air in victory. He was so relieved that somebody had seen him and that he was obviously going to be picked up. But the pilot flew over Carl's campsite a third time and the pilot witnessed Carl just casually walk back into his tent. He looked nonchalant and unconcerned. The pilot thought that Carl was saying that he's all good. Nothing about it made it seem like Carl was in trouble. So from Carl's point of view, he's super relieved, super excited to see a plane. He punched the air in celebration. He waved his sleeping bag at the plane so they'd see him. And then he went back into his tent to start packing. He was going to pack up all his stuff so he would be ready when the plane landed to come rescue him. That's why the pilot saw him go back into the tent. Carl was going to start packing so he'd be ready. But to the pilot's point of view, this just made it look like Carl was not in distress and that he didn't need help. Why would he go back into his tent like that as if he was going to take a nap if he was in distress? Carl wrote the following entries about this incident. Unfortunately, the airplane was on wheels and couldn't land, so I stopped waving after its first pass. I then got busy packing things up and getting ready to break camp. As sunset approached, I began to doubt if the pilot took me seriously. I certainly hope he didn't think that my having stopped waving meant I thought he might have been someone else at first or something. So from that entry, it's clear that Carl just thought the plane was like assessing his situation, couldn't land because of the wheels, and was so was going to get help and that somebody was going to come back within a few hours. But as night fell, Carl then realized that he actually made the wrong signal. He found the signal card on the back of his hunting license. In his journal, he wrote, I recall raising my right hand, shoulder high, and shaking my fist on the plane's second pass. It was a little cheer, like when your team scored a touchdown or something. Turns out that's the signal for all okay. Do not wait. It's certainly my fault I'm here now. Man, I can't believe it. I really feel like a klutz. Now I know why nobody's shown up from that incident. Can you imagine thinking you're being rescued and they misunderstood your signal? Look, Carl definitely did not deserve this whole ordeal. And I understand that everything that possibly could go wrong did go wrong. But on the other hand, I'm also like, if you're going to survive in the middle of the Alaskan wilderness, which Alaska has some of the toughest terrain to live in on your own, especially without any shelter other than a tent, how could you not know the signals for help? Wouldn't you know the basics of survival and the basics of what you need to do if you get in trouble. Like I'm trying really hard not to judge Carl because it definitely doesn't matter now, but I just don't understand how you wouldn't know, like you didn't prepare at all for a five month excursion alone in the Alaskan wilderness. It just blows my freaking mind. The other tragic thing is that there was actually a hunting cabin five miles away from Carl's camp. The cabin was full of supplies and allegedly Carl knew about this cabin. He was talking to a state trooper before his trip. The state trooper was the one that helped him mark his camp on the maps. The state trooper says that he told Carl about that cabin. However, nobody knows why Carl never tried to get to it and why he never used it. Maybe there was something about the area, like maybe he couldn't get to it. Maybe he had completely forgotten about it. Maybe he was just already too weak already and was already so hungry that he wasn't thinking straight. And then the other thing that really confuses me about this story is that his friends did send a state trooper to go check on him. And yeah, he got the signal wrong. The state trooper didn't go save him because he thought that he was fine. But then when he doesn't return with Carl and the state trooper tells his friends that he was fine, 
wouldn't they check back in a few weeks later? Like, it blows my mind that he, nobody checks on him again after that. I don't know what they think is going on. Like, why would his friends and family think that another five months would be just fine? Like, I, do you know what I mean? Like, I don't understand why nobody checked in after that. A few weeks later, came back to see if he was okay. Like, it's just very everything about this story, like mistakes that Carl made, mistakes that his family and friends made, and then just that combined with some really, really shitty luck. Anyway, so now we're into the fall and in Alaska, it starts snowing and everything starts freezing over. While Carl was digging a trench one day, he came across somebody else's like old supplies from a long time ago. He found a few rabbit snares and some like pieces of candles. He used these rabbit snares to set traps hoping that he could get some food while he was sleeping. But again, just as Carl's luck goes, he was competing with the foxes and the wolves in the area who will often catch on to the fact that they're snares and will remember where they are and go steal your game from it. If you've ever watched the show Alone, that happens a lot in that show, that reality show where uh, they often will set traps and then some critter near their campsite will like catch on to the traps that they set and will go check them for food and steal the game. If you've ever seen that show, you can have empathy for how frustrating this is. And that's like with people that know that somebody's going to come get them eventually and that doctors are checking on them. Poor Carl was getting his food stolen and he had no idea when or if anybody was going to come save him. Around this kind of time, probably in October, he wrote this entry. It's been a terrible day for me and I won't go into it. Hands getting more frostbitten every day. Have only one meal of beans left. Honestly, I'm scared for my life, but I won't give up. So it's now October. Carl seems to start understanding the direness of his situation. However, he still seems to have a little bit of hope. In spite of this, he was getting more desperate for food. He couldn't hunt. I think he probably ran out of, you know, ammo anyway, because he threw a bunch of it into the river at the beginning. The snares weren't working. He started literally eating tree bark and would even like settle for leftovers that hawks would leave behind. Like the hawk would eat some of its prey and then would leave some of the carcass and Carl would literally go eat that because... I mean, any of us would. He's really, really desperate by this point, and it did keep him alive a little longer. However, come November, Carl completely ran out of food. Now, here's another thing that a lot of people question about this story, which I certainly do too. A town or city called Fort Yukon was 75 miles away. Now, according to all the sources, Carl simply couldn't make it there because it was super snowy, the weather wouldn't allow it, and he was simply starving and very weak. So of course he could not walk 75 miles. But a lot of people, including myself, wonder why he didn't start the journey to Fort Yukon like back in September when he realized nobody was coming for him. Like once September came around, August was over, you knew by this point that you had a miscommunication with your pilot they weren't coming for you. Why wouldn't you start walking in that direction? He could have easily, I mean, even in pretty rough terrain, he could have easily walked five to 10 miles per day and he could have made it to Fort Yukon or at least to some sort of civilization for somebody to find him in about probably, I mean, if he was really powering through a week, but probably in a couple weeks. You'd think he would consider doing this in September as he knew the snow was going to come. He knew the weather was going to get too bad to walk. So wouldn't you want to beat the stormy weather and start in September? It would have really sucked. Don't get me wrong. It would have been very, very difficult to walk that far when you're already that weak, but he probably could have survived. Again, nobody knows why he didn't do that. Maybe he was still holding out hope that somebody was coming and he didn't want to leave the campsite because if he was lost somehow walking to Fort Yukon, they then wouldn't be able to find his campsite. That's the only thing I can think of, but uh, you know, we'll never know. I mean, I can't help but think about all of these things and speculate about why he could have done this or that. But I do, of course, understand that if you're not in that situation, you have no idea. I mean, for all we know, Carl had a severe mental illness that didn't show up until he was alone halfway through the Alaska 
Alaskan excursion. For all we knew, maybe he had an actual mental break after becoming starved or he had some other medical condition that prevented him from doing all these things and we just don't know about it. So the glimmer of hope that Carl had in October and up until this point was still there. But by November, around Thanksgiving, pretty much all of his hope was gone. He was depressed and just very, very frail and weak. He wrote in his journal, I'm frightened my end is near. If things get too miserable, I've always got a bullet around. But I think I'm too chicken for that. Besides, that may be the only sin I've ever committed. During this same time, he would write in his journal about having these random bouts of dizziness and just always being freezing cold. He was getting body tremors and his fingers were showing signs of frostbite. It was in December that Carl finally decided that this was in fact hopeless. No one was coming for him. He was out of food and he was out of options. He knew at this point that he could not make it through winter. So he finally made the decision that instead of slowly starving to death, he was just going to do it the quick way. On the night of his death, Carl built a fire with his remaining fuel. He wrote a letter to his father, which included instructions on how to develop the film from his trip. He asked that any of his belongings be given to his father, except for the person who found his body was welcome to take his rifle and his shotgun for their trouble. He wrote the following entries right before... Dear God in heaven, please forgive me my weakness and my sins. Please look over my family. Am burning the last of my emergency Coleman light and just fed the fire the last of my split wood. When the ashes cool, I'll be cooling along with them. I chickened out once already, but I don't want to go through the chills again. They say it doesn't hurt. And with that, Carl pinned his driver's license to the note, and that was it. On December 18th, 1981, Carl unalived himself. It wasn't until January 19th, the next month in 1982, when his family and friends finally called authorities to check on Carl again. What a frustrating story. I'm so annoyed. Like if he had just held on, like he was surviving, if he could just hold on a few more weeks, somebody would have found him. But I understand the misery of not knowing if somebody was coming or not. Like he didn't know that they were gonna come in January. If they had a date they were coming, he might've stuck it out. And then the other frustrating part is that you also have to ask why it took so long for them to finally send a search out. I don't get it. Anyway, so January 19th, the weather was too bad, so they could not go. The, the weather at this time, mind you, was in the negative 40s degree Fahrenheit. So finally, on February 2nd, a ski-equipped plane went over Carl's campsite. State troopers finally landed by Carl's camp. His tent was zipped shut and they found Carl's corpse inside of the tent. And with him, they found his 100 page diary. Carl was 35 years old. All right, if you have made it to this far in the video, first of all, thank you so much. But if you are enjoying my videos and you have the means, um, I do have a Patreon that's always linked down below. You get lots of extra perks for joining the Patreon. Mid tiers get an extra video that nobody else gets every single month. Um, everybody gets pulled everybody gets Netflix parties, early access to a lot of the videos, and a lot more. So if you're interested in that, just go check it out. And that's it for today. Please like the video just to help the channel, and I'll see you all in the next one. Speaking of, thank you so much to all of my patrons. They're all on the screen now, and our top tiers are Colin Holmes, The Deck of Cards, Michelle Valdovinos, Tom L., Little Kittle Cat, Mitchell Schaefer Meyer, Mike, Alice Paul, Brittany Phillips, Willow Winchester, Bambi, Momo Neon, Philip J, Marita 144, Sage K, Literally Lacey, Elderly Hipster, Reese Rolls, The Puppy Hag, Rebecca Jackson, Headless Fancy, Toby, Carter, Kawaka Anime and Gating Convention, Sonder, Sarah the Crazy Fish Lady, Blood for the Koi, Larkrar, Maxi, Ashley Danielle, Ellison Luna, Julieta, Cece Picard, Sophia Wood, a bunny apparently, and Leon Vanek.